Welcome back to Character Creation Cast. This is the last part of our fifth series, where we discuss Edge of the Empire with the folks from Redemption. Yeah, they were so much fun to record with, uh, and we had so much to say. It's a wonder that we were able to get things edited down as much as we did. Uh, but on another note, if you missed the She's a Super Geek episode from two weeks ago, uh, where I was able to guest on, uh, today would be a great day to catch up because tomorrow, if you're listening to this the day we release this episode, they will be releasing the second half of the game where we play Everyone is Prince John, which is basically a parody of Everyone is John. Um, and Emily, who you'll hear on this episode today, uh, runs us through some pixie shenanigans. Uh, so it should be well worth listen. Before we get into our review, we have uh, one other announcement that we uh, now have our own Facebook page. So we will have a link to that in the show notes if you prefer to do your social media on Facebook rather than Twitter or the various other places. Um, you can now connect with us there as well. Yeah, and if you head on over there and like the page, we'll have updates about the latest episodes on there as well as some other content that we'll be figuring out over time. Um, and you can also leave a review on that page if you'd like. And we will maybe read it here. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> And speaking of that, we have another review, so we will go ahead and read that one. This review is titled Game Design Insights for the Player by Legend of Grayson from the USA. I love character creation. It's one of my favorite parts, but character creation cast is more than that. By looping in longtime players and even creators of a certain system, they bring insight into how the game is designed and structured and how they enable certain choices or decision making. For anyone, and foremost, those looking at what character creation for a certain system might entail, how it connects to the wider system, or wondering how their favorite AP characters are put together, this is a great cast. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Legend of Grayson. Yes, thank you, Grayson. Oh, and Grayson is on Twitter, um, at, at Legend of Grayson, and they are partially responsible for the Trans Language Primer, which is a super great resource, especially now that we are in Pride Month, so... If you want to go oh, check that really out, cool. too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely check that out. And also, if you have a moment, uh, aside from doing all of that awesome stuff that we just mentioned, uh, please go ahead and go over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review or just give us a rating. You don't even need to leave a review. All of that will help us be discovered by more and more people. And we also love hearing what all of you have to say about what we're doing on here. With all of that out of the way, here is the show. Yeah, enjoy. back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of space outlaws for Star Wars Edge of the Empire. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Chris, Michael, and Emily of the Redemption Podcast, a Star Wars Edge of the Empire actual play podcast on the RPG Academy Network. We will start with uh, Emily this time. Hey! Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the character you made in our last episode? Sure. I'm Emily. I play Isla Zarla on Redemption. And for our character creation, I created a decommissioned assassin droid, HK-31, who kind of got pulled into this weird family situation without really meaning to. He was... <laughs> they... She, I haven't decided on gender pronouns for HK-31. Uh, you know, they used to be a Republic assassin droid, but the Republic doesn't exist anymore. So the question is, what do you do now? That's true. And Michael, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us about your character? No. Okay. <laughs> Chris. Uh, I will. <laughs> he plays someone who can't I'm take a hint on redemption. I'm uh, oh yeah that's true I I play I'm Michael I played Tazi on Redemption uh, and for our Michael. session here I've created a a slicer who is a droid uh, by the name of Sparks and he's been brought to this group 
uh, through a contract with his employer looking for information about the former Jedi Temple and the religion of the Jedi. All right. Finally, Chris, you uh, created the character with us last time as well. Uh, could you tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about your character? I am the Game Master for the Redemption Podcast. And All I'm hail. a player. <laughs> uh, I'm also a player on uh, a Shadow of the Demon Lord actual play called Tales of Blood and Stone. And the character I made is an ex-Clone Wars. Uh, technically, he's a T-Series tactical droid. He was formerly in charge of a small group of droids who did not survive. And he has a strong sense of responsibility to keep the current droids that are under him alive. All right. And Ryan, do you want to tell us about the character that you made? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I created the character named Edric Farfaller, or uh, EF1 to uh, Captain 1124. Um, and he is a human, uh, which is rare in this group now. And he is a Force-sensitive medic that was basically raised by these droids uh, after Order 66 went down and there were no uh, Jedi left to look after him and guide him. Uh, so he escaped. Well, actually, he was captured with uh, D3W1 and rescued by HK31. And that's how he's, uh, he's, he's kind of known these droids his whole life because he was rescued at the ripe old age of approximately three or four. It's a good time to be rescued. Exactly. It's no time like the present. <laughs> How about yourself, Amelia? Um, I also made a droid. Uh, I made a protocol droid, D3W1, um, who was a librarian, essentially, in the Jedi Temple um, and was responsible for rescuing and then raising Edric along with HK31 um, and now have a wealth of very valuable information uh, that the Empire is probably looking for. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? Are you going to ship us free D20s if we in engage in this? Uh, virtual ones. <laughs> I mean... I'll take it. Someday that would be... Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <That's Brandon laughs> there you go. I'll, I'll roll the D20 for you. My, uh, 16. There you go. That one's, that one's just for you, Emily. Just for you. You get 16. Yep. Nice. Yeah. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process, uh, how it feels in this system compared to others that they've played, and uh, also we like to get to know our guests uh, a little bit better. So first, uh, we'd like to ask each of you, how did you get into role-playing games in the first place? Oh, God. Speaking of going to college in Missouri... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'm going first. So <laughs> I had been interested in in all of the things that like role players tend to be interested in, but never had a group or anything before college to play with. And then I happened to move in across from a my friend. Well, he became my friend. He was obviously a stranger when we moved in. Uh, a guy named John John, who was an experienced uh, dungeon master. And so he sort of introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, but he didn't have time to like DM a whole group. So a another student uh, tried to GM Mage for us, but he was terrible. <laughs> Long story short, I was elected DM in a bloodless coup. And... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is and, it even worth having then if it's bloodless well it was because then we got to play at least oh, nice. our oh, GM true. was a little flaky so you shouldn't kill the other players right and so I've sort of on and off been playing and it was sort of only Dungeons and Dragons until I met Senda and at one point she was like you know this character you're playing in, in this campaign would be a great fate character you want to switch to fate <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what's fate? And then we started a podcast called She's a Super Geek, um, which has gotten me into like the indie side and a whole lot of other things. So 
Turns out starting a podcast is a great way to learn about a lot of other games. That's very true. It, it really is. And I'm lucky enough to have a partner who's super outgoing and goes to a lot of conventions. And so she comes back and she's like, oh, look at this and this and this Kickstarter is <laughs> happening in six months and let's plan for this. And I'm just like, yay, I'll edit. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. It works. It works pretty good. So Yeah. Well, I'd like to say on a personal note, she's a super geek, got me into the independent role-playing scene as well. Mm. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. That's that's one of our unspoken goals. Well, actually, no, it's not unspoken. Because um, <laughs> you just said it now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, at the start of every episode, we're like, we're highlighting women as GMs, but we also really love highlighting independent games or doing games differently and you know, one of our favorite arcs that people keep talking about is one last job we did as adult magical girls. You know, so we love, we just love doing stuff like that. Fantastic. Love that one so much. Me too. All right. Uh, eeny, meeny, meeny, mo. Uh, let's go with Chris. Uh, I got into playing games, uh, I believe it was seventh or eighth grade. I was playing basketball in the little hometown I'm from. And one of the, uh, one of my friends that was there, he was a couple years older while we were shooting hoops, just said, Hey, my sister moved back into town and her husband wants to play this game and he wants a couple of people. Do you guys want to play this Dungeons and Dragons thing? And I was like, what is it? He goes, I don't know. We make up a story and we kill things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's real. I was like, I'm there. <laughs> why not? Um, so I showed up at the first game session and it was very interesting because one of the other kids that got invited was kind of my nemesis at school. <gasps> oh, this is so good. So literally we didn't really like each other, but he, anything I did, he was always better at it. And he always had to make sure he told everybody how much better he was Ooh. at it. So we sit down to play D and D. And of course, he's already the expert. He's already telling me how to build characters. And I'm looking at the game master, James, going, uh, what do I do? And James is like, here, you're going to play a fighter and a wizard. We're going to play basic D&D, &D, and I'm going to teach you the rules. And I remember we started going through the adventure, and we're fighting a couple of hobgoblin bosses, and I'm playing the mage who cast his one spell. And then I went, what can I do? And he said, what do you want to do? And I looked at my character sheet, and he'd given me rope. So I said, can I lasso his sword and pull it out so the bad guy doesn't have a weapon? Sure. <laughs> you can try. <laughs> I did try. I learned dice are not my friends, <laughs> and I failed. Mm. Second round, I said, hey, I've got this oil. Can I light it and throw it on him? Sure, go ahead. I failed, almost at the, uh, one of the other players, and I just kept coming up with different ways of trying to have this ma magic user do things. I threw my backpack at him. I was <laughs> to the point where I was going to throw my robes. <laughs> I just had ran out of things to do. But what really hooked me was uh, James was driving me home, and he was sitting there with Kurt, his brother-in-law. And James looked over at Kurt and said, who do you think was the all-star tonight? And Kurt just kind of got quiet and went, oh, I don't know. And then James went, it's the guy in the back seat. And he pointed at me. And James goes, he's trying to create solutions when everybody else was just creating more problems for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. And I was hooked from then on uh, for quite a while. Myself, James, Kurt used to play. And we tried writing our own system and then found out somebody else had already written it called Rollmaster. <laughs> so we played that for a while. Yeah, uh, we played for quite a while. And then, you know, when I went off to college, I found a group in college and just kept playing. That's awesome. I love so that. That's such 20... a cool, like, a cool thing to do as a GM to be like, this went well. And like that moment, how it changes something like that. Like, that's so neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, 28 years later, I still remember that whole campaign and playing those first characters and just my love of the game and how quickly it developed. Yeah. That's awesome. What about you, Michael? How did you get your start? I started back um, in the early 80s with the red box uh D, &D original red box D, &D. Uh, <laughs> i got it from a family member as a birthday gift uh and i opened it up and i think i read all the books cover to cover for on and off for weeks like i just loved the system 
and I got my friends to get into it. And I also suckered one of my friends at the time. I think it was Josh to run the game for us. I suckered him into being the DM because I didn't want to run the game. I wanted to play the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is a trend that continues to this day. Uh, I love the storytelling aspects of role playing. I've I we got into you know back as a child as a kid like a teenager we got into the original Marvel superheroes role playing game. We used to play that all the time. We played Traveler. We played a, a lot of different things. I went to my first Gen Con in '93, um, and then I didn't go again until 2015. <laughs> um, uh, but it's been uh, it's one of those things where you know I, I think I moved away from it for a long time in my early twenties. And then, you know, a few years ago I got back into it and then met up with Chris and Kendall. I've known Kendall for the majority of my life. We've been friends for a very, very, very long time. And we played a star Wars game together and we thought, Hey, this might make a good podcast. And and here we are now. So yeah, I just love role-playing all its forms. I love the story. The storytelling aspect of it is the thing I enjoy mm-hmm. most. I've always had a little bit of an actor in me, so I like being able to make up characters and voices. I really get into that stuff. I think that's a lot of fun. Fleshing out backgrounds, giving people motivation, giving characters motivation. I, you know, I love all those things. Uh, and as most people who know me will tell you, especially in the like the podcasting vein, I will do anything to be on your show. So <laughs> <laughs> He's not joking. I am not joking. Man, we could have asked for a lot more. You really, really could have. <laughs> Well, if we ever need an, an extra person, well, we know who to call. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm happy to throw time in my schedule. <laughs> awesome. So when you guys sit down to make characters for any game, not necessarily just for Edge of the Empire, do you guys have a, a personal process that you usually go through or a certain way that you, you like to think about character creation? Uh, I generally come up with a concept first based on kind of how the tables discussed, what kind of setting we want to play in, and what kind of environment we're going to be interacting with. And then I come up with a concept and then pretty much look at the system and go, how can I make the mechanics fit this concept? I I don't do the other way around just because that's not how my brain works. I can find a way to make the math fit the concept. I can't find a way to make the concept fit the math, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's the same way that I am too. (laughs) I'm a, I'm a lot the same, honestly. Uh, I like to come up with a concept first. Um, if we can, you know, if you can get a good session zero in where everybody's kind of on the same page, great. But uh, at the same time, I'll get familiar with the materials, combine that with my concept and see what fleshes out. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some things I'll try and get locked down before we start. And then as Chris will tell you, there's a lot about like, there's a lot about my characters that I like to kind of develop as we play. Yes. Um, especially when it comes down to, like, background history for characters and, you know, relationships and funny anecdotes, that type of thing. I mean, let's be honest, uh, Tazi on Redemption, most of his backstory was generated from a Twitter meme, so. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yep. My mother, all the details about my life, uh, or about, not my life, all the details about Tazi's life as a, a young Duro was generated 90% from uh, the tell me, like, give me one like and I'll tell you one thing about my character. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Very cool. And That's by the awesome. time that was done, Kendall was like, you realize we have to document all of this. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. We do. Because <laughs> it's all canon now. That's amazing. That's where Verita came from. Oh, really? Yep. Well, thank you, Twitter meme, because Verita yeah. is amazing. Yeah. I hope so, yeah. anyway. <laughs> but part of the character creation with what Mike was just saying with building characters as you go, that you have to kind of understand your game master and the other players. Mm-hmm. And yes. really understand, can they roll with stuff? Um, I've thrown stuff as a player at a game master, and the game master's just gone, no, nah, I can't fit that in. Right. And I've run with other game masters that are like, oh my god, that's so cool. Give me a second to write that down. And I'll figure out how to tie it in later. Mm -hmm. So you really need to know who's game mastering and can they handle that? Yeah. Because not not everybody can. I'd third that, yeah. And that's, sounds like Emily's on board with that and I will be also the third. You do, it really does depend on your group too. Mm -hmm. I like to have a strong sense of a character and then develop mannerizations and and extended sort of history through play. Kind of like Michael. The system I've, done that has kind of fit that the best has been Headspace, Mm -hmm. where you sort of have to build group history together, and you have to have a good feeling for your character, but it's not until you start playing the game that you sort of start embodying that character. 
And I I love it when there are moments that something clicks. I was, uh, unfortunately, this it was recorded but didn't actually get out several years ago. I was a part of something called Moon Cops in the Sayer universe in the Geekly Inc. Uh, crew. And there was a moment in this, it was several sessions in, like I just couldn't quite find my character. I couldn't quite find um, an emotional connection with her. Mm -hmm. And someone said, I I guess I can make spoilers because no one's ever going to hear this. Uh, Someone basically, well, we found out that we were basically... 3D printed versions of ourselves and our memories had been transported basically on data chips and like stuck into these 3D printed versions. And I just sat back in my chair and I was like, oh, hell no. And it was like this moment of like, oh, I get it. Like, this is my character. Like, you know, we, I, I understand her relationship to other people. And now I get like one of her deep seated things. She's a very physically embodied person. Person And the idea of not physically being the same person is very distressful. Mm -hmm. And there have been several occasions that's sort of the most succinct one. And I just I just absolutely love those moments, moments where you forget you're playing a character and it's just like you're talking. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I love Redemption is there are lots of those moments. Uh, uh, The first moments I've actually had as a character doing a romantic storyline. And so that's been that's been real different for me. That's awesome. How how does my character feel about romantic relationships? Usually I'm like, yeah, that won't come up. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have the right kind of group for stuff like right. that. But it's always fun when you have those moments of like full yes. immersion yeah. and you know, yeah. realizing like, okay, now I know who I am as a person. Yes. Yep. I can um, also speak to it's really awesome to pick an NPC that you've listened to or um, and try to voice them when you don't actually have the commitment of doing them as a character mm-hmm. and then try and flesh them out. Like that's actually been a pretty fun process too. Mm-hmm. Has it, I feel like I wouldn't, I would not like that at all. I would not like the idea of like having to be well, that character that somebody else like. That's where the amnesia comes in. That's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that, that was kind of our, our step towards, uh, really letting Isla become her own character was, well, Everything she said might be not a lie because she didn't know it was a lie, but it might not be, you know, like fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, originally, you know, Emily was just doing the voiceover work and I was actually role playing the scenes out with Mike at the table. Mm-hmm. And Awkward. <laughs> it, it was a little bit, but it was supposed to be. Yeah. You know, the, the characters were supposed to be awkward. So we played that off really well. And then I just said, you know what? I don't like just having somebody do the voiceovers because I, I don't I don't feel like it captures the true feeling of being at the table. Yeah. Mm-hmm. N- not saying that people were doing it bad, just there's a spontaneity at the table that is different. So well, I wanted people to on, come on and do it. On top of that, Chris, there's a difference between like voicing like kind of a one-off character for a, a short story arc, right? Like you might have a couple of instances of that character, but Isla had become a character an NPC that was making frequent appearances and was a major part of a storyline mm-hmm. that we were going to move forward with. We mm-hmm. had to have somebody that we trusted Aww. that we knew would do a good job of playing as this character. And, you know, and here we have Emily. I mean, she did a great job with the reads that we gave her and we were like, this is why, why move away from this. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a different dynamic to, to having like another player character as opposed to a gm npc too um just because the gm has a little bit of an idea where you know you kind of want to bring the story and it i think it's hard not to influence some of that role play in Mm -hmm. in ways that you don't necessarily mean to or ways that a player wouldn't right well and i as a whenever i gm i find full immersion very hard to create for myself and so especially diving not exactly head first but but having a storyline that involves sort of this awkward romantic part. Like if one of the reasons I haven't experienced that is because I, as a GM, whenever I GM, like I've never even considered doing that. Like, yes, you'll have, you might have the, the awkward bard trying to flirt with one of your characters, but you're not going to have a romantic storyline. Like for me, that's just a little too hard to, to do. So it's, 
I mean, I can't speak for Chris, obviously. I don't know uh, his process, but so it might have just been easier. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too difficult. I just jump into the scene and let it go. That's kind of one of the advantages with the group we have is I can trust the group to just let a scene develop and I don't have to feel like I need to control the mm-hmm. scene. True. I, I, and that's <laughs> always how I've gained. By every episode. Yeah. <laughs> there, <laughs> that, well, there are a lot of notes that have gotten changed or crossed off or thrown across the room and there's a lot that are added mm-hmm. and that's just how I've always run games. Yeah. That's what's natural to me. It's hard for me to try to railroad characters. That's yeah. really, that's very difficult for me. Like that to... takes too much planning. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. It's not just the planning. For me, it feels uncomfortable to take the player's freedom mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. You know, if, for example, if, if you're at the bar and, you know, you, you get the typical old wizard that comes up and says, I found this old map. Can you guys go rescue the princess who's here? And you guys go, no. Okay, cool. Well, what are we going to do then? Like, I don't want to have to look at the players and go, no, you have to go rescue the princess because that's what I planned. Yeah. It might come back later to bite us in the butt if we don't. Absolutely. But we don't have to. Exactly. And and that's how you kind of teach your players. Uh, if you continually have consequences for them not doing what you planned, uh, eventually they're going to get the hint that, you know, hey, maybe we should follow these you know, plot hooks that this uh that our gm who is gming for us who is you know allowing us to play this game and ha- our most benevolent gm for allowing <laughs> exactly. us to be here <laughs> and, and who's done all this prep work and you're just like nah we don't care that sounds like somebody who gms a lot of games right <laughs> yeah <laughs> as someone who doesn't yeah. do that and just likes to show up yeah i have no respect for your time or the effort you put into this <laughs> oh. uh, there's a great book called always prepared that is basically about being never prepared. Yep. You should read it. As as the player who never GMs, I'll apologize in advance, but I'm likely going to make you jump through some hoops because what you hooked up might not be what I want to play. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. I've I've discovered the longer I GM, the I don't want to say the less I plan, but the I I plan a lot less on paper and mo- way more imaginatively because in some instances i know the system well enough to not have to prepare as i used to um and i have a lot more copies of things now so i can look up things in a monster manual really quickly and i'm not as scared now that i have some experience under my belt and all that so i used to prep probably between 80 and 90 percent of what we actually did and if they did something that I wasn't expecting, I told them. And let me tell you what, I never expect for characters to knock on doors. If you want to throw me off, knock on a door that you're supposed to do something else with. Because I will be like, I have no idea what happened. Who's there? Who's there? Yeah, and I've gotten a little bit a bit looser about that the, mm-hmm. the more I've GM'd. So. I, uh, I should apologize for that comment to Ryan. Um, <laughs> That makes me sound like an antagonistic player, and I'm very much not that player, but I do appreciate being able to put a, a, a GM on the spot mm-hmm. and have something kind of really creative come out of it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I used to be, I used to be the type of uh, GM that I had to plan pretty much everything. I, I came from the, the 90s style of games uh, that the, the GM was all, and the players were just, you know, didn't have too much input uh, into that style because we were in middle school. W- were you were you more like was it more like a combative like GM versus players instead of like a cooperative environment? It was, yeah, it was it was a lot of that sort of mentality that we when we first learned role playing in '93 and going onwards um, into the late '90s, we always had this mentality of the the players are there to win the adventure. And the the GM's job is to try to prevent them from winning the adventure, but in a fair way, you know? So you had all this control over the story. But um, getting into all the podcasts, and this is a major aside, so uh, Mm -hmm. uh, getting into all these different podcasts, these actual plays, 
uh, all that sort of stuff has uh, it basically enlightened me to a better way to GM. So, Michael, have you ever GM? Ever? Um, yes, I have. I GM'd a game of Marvel once. Uh, it didn't go poorly, but I didn't enjoy the experience, mm-hmm. so I didn't try to replicate it. I kind of GM'd a little bit at our uh, Redemption Patreon game at a Catacon. Chris had me uh, kind of sit in his seat and play through an, an encounter with the uh, Knight Brothers. Oh. Oh, geez. Uh, the the, the Zabrax that are kept by the Knight Sisters. Mm. Yep. Um, I kind of GM'd that. I didn't actually roll dice, but I was kind of playing the part of Storyteller and the major NPC in that particular situation. That was fun. Mm-hmm. But again, like, I... I don't really get into like the planning and prep part of it. I really like the agency of being a player yeah. and kind of living vicariously through this character that I've created and not necessarily the the larger storytelling process mm-hmm. or the larger planning process, really. I think that's it. I'm lazy. I don't like to plan. <laughs> and GMing feels like it takes just too much planning, even though I'm experienced with the fact that it doesn't necessarily play out that way. I've seen Chris crumple up eight pages of notes and throw them in the garbage can next to the table within five minutes of our game starting. <laughs> you know. Oh, that um, makes me feel so bad. I can't see oh, stuff was, wait, like no, that. No, it, was, it was before. It was, it was before Isla. Okay. It was pre-Isla. <laughs> but I mean, that's yeah, just P.I. as we say. No, I'm on the same page with you, though, that like I I like I like the interactive part of being a player. I like interacting with the story hooks and things that a GM gives me. I don't necessarily like being the one that has to put those forward. Mm-hmm. I yeah. like being able to collaborate with other people to kind of come up with a story, which yeah. I'm aware that GMs mm-hmm. do. But it, I, I like to finish what other people start. <laughs> I really love watching players make their own trouble. Mm-hmm. I really love setting up, I mean, my my favorite one shots to do, and I can't I can't do it anymore. I used to do it at conventions and stuff like that because I did it for Sass Geek, our first D&D little adventure where it's like, hey, somebody's having a party, go steal a thing. I have run that adventure multiple times with different groups and they have never done the same thing. That was the first time a knock on the door happened actually was there was a cleric in the party who's like, who was of noble birth and just knocked on the door and was like, Hey, I lost my invitation. You know, here's who my parents are and (laughs) rolled really well on some checks. And I was like, well, uh, everybody else has spent like three hours trying to get into the party. You just spent five minutes. Mm -hmm. Good job. But then they give sort of giving them enough uh, other stuff to really step in more trouble. Because once you're in the party, how do you get out to find the thing Mm -hmm. and whatnot? So that's really cool. And I like finding all that trouble. Like that's that's the thing that I like to do. Mm -hmm. Like you hand me the rope, I will hang myself. (laughs) See, that was the metaphor I was really trying not to make. (laughs) Yeah, virtual fist bump, boom. That is exactly. I I love. I love the look on Chris's face when we throw him a loop and I get to see him thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just, I I like being able to, this is a thing that it took me a long time to learn because I originally gamed with people who were very much power gamers. Oh, I'm so sorry. um, (laughs) (laughs) I always say this, like, if that's the game that you like to play, that is fine. Yeah. Every play style is valid unless, until it impacts other people. (laughs) <laughs> right, and the thing is, just like that was not yes. that was not how I like to play. I, I, we had people who would sort of you know fudge their dice rolls, and mm. which that is not okay. Um, but they they never wanted to fail, and I'm very big on like failing forward. Mm-hmm. And yes, we, like our failures, failing is way more interesting. Well, and like you think about who you are as a person and you are defined by the bad choices you make as much as the good ones. And so I like being able to explore those things narratively. Yeah. And so when you're in a group of people that only ever want to succeed at things and always, you know, want to power game and min max and all that kind of stuff, it was not the experience that I was looking for. And I love now getting to play in these games where people are like, yeah, it goes horribly wrong. Let's see what happens. You know, it's like, I know I shouldn't do this, but I need to know how it plays out. I'm going to do the cool Star Wars thing and just like athletics jump over the bad guys. 
right? and then I fail. I'll just shoot and, this door panel and yeah. see what happens. Mm-hmm. Someone grabs me by the ankle and plants me face first in asphalt. That would never happen. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. Uh, all right. So that was a, a wonderful uh, tangent <laughs> that we all went into. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, where did we start with that question again? That was- um, how long how is this podcast? Like we, this might be our first two-part discussion episode. That's oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so many firsts with the cast from Redemption. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was the question about uh, what your design philosophy is for creating the character. Basically. Oh, is that where that started? That's where that, that is exactly where that started. <laughs> yes, it oh, is. But I, I love the conversation, so feel free. Okay, so... How do we think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've played? Well, being the guy that's probably done the most out of our group here, I like the way that system is designed. I like building characters, especially if you get the character generator like I have. It's easy to come up with a concept and just plug it in. It's just real cut and paste, so to speak, and you can just go right in and whip out a character in a short Mm -hmm. time if you really understand the system. I really like the fact that the system is opened up that your character can literally do whatever you want to do, and you build it to be how good you want it to be at certain things. So it doesn't limit you as, you know, oh, you're the cleric, you get to cast the divine spells. In this system, if you want to be a healer, you can be a healer. It doesn't matter your career, you just take skills and medicine. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty flexible. Yeah. Um, I like that you don't have to start out as something to get into it fairly easily yes Uh, like especially with a lot of it being skill-based you just need to go into another tree uh that gives you access to more things and now you've got a whole new career path that you can kind of work around yeah i really dig the trees i think that they they give me they're basically like a group of anything here will make your character better at that thing. And you can sort of decide with your, you know, whatever characterizations you have, like what would make sense for my character? What would make sense with the the adventures we've already gone through? That part I really like. Mm-hmm. I feel like it streams it streamlines it a lot because it makes it pretty clear. Like if you're going to do this thing, here's the things that you should, you know. Yeah. Here's the skills that you should have and the things you should be good at mm-hmm. if this is your goal. Yeah. So I like that right up at the top, it's like, if you want to be a medic, here's some things to think about. Yeah. You know, the skill trees kind of lay it all out for you um, instead of having to flip through a book and say, what skills do I even need? Like, what relates to mm-hmm. this? Yeah. And I, I also like that it you can still do things even if you don't have the skill. Yes. Yeah, that feels important. That and... I. I when Emily talks about the trees, I enjoy the fact that the benefits that you get from the trees typically are dice modifications. They're not necessarily skill boosts per se, but you're modifying the dice pool. Yep. And again, with the narrative dice pool, what you're really doing is using those skills to kind of help tell your story. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a pass fail system. Yeah. You know, you can succeed with with a with a bunch of threats that modify how you're going to tell how that success worked and the results, mm-hmm. or vice versa. You can fail with a number of advantages, and as we mentioned, as kind of it was mentioned earlier, you can kind of fail upward or fail forward. Uh, you know, the failure doesn't mean that you didn't make an opening for somebody else, right? Or that you didn't do something to positively impact your situation. Can and I those, ask one those, thing? Yeah. Yeah. I say in play, do you find that it's hard to keep track of those things? That would be my only concern, having not played the system necessarily. But like, you know, all the things in the skill trees do, it's like this this adds a blue die, this adds a, or takes away a black die. Or do you find when you're playing that it's hard to remember all of the, the this adds something, this takes it away, this, or do you pick that up pretty quickly? I mean, I I don't think it's any different in that particular respect than other systems that give you player or character abilities that you have to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Because that's all the talent trees really are in this case is it's just a list of things that you're good at, right? Or things that you can use to benefit you or cause somebody else a a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So it you know at the end of the day it it's just like any other when you get into a into a situation where you're looking at the talent trees 
it's about kind of planning, trying to plan your moves as best you can. Yeah. Uh, and use the talents you have to your advantage. Or in, in some cases, as, as happens to us in Redemption so often, you know, you may not be trying to succeed. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, we've found ourselves a number of times doing things that aren't necessarily good for the story for the outcome but good for the story and good for what we're Yeah, like somebody tries to shoot Dooku. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. Um Yeah. <laughs> thanks for mentioning it. I appreciate that. <laughs> Is that a thing that you guys do at your I mean, do you guys do that at a table outside of recording for a podcast? Like do you do you find yourself making those those kinds of decisions that are maybe not optimal for your character, or do you do that more when you're playing for an audience? I can speak for myself, and I can I can think I can speak for, for Kendall and probably Chris in this respect, and you know to an extent Emily. I I think these decisions are literally made at the table with no consideration for the rest of the table. It's <laughs> it's a um. it's this is something that we're doing. Get on board. <laughs> I think it also fits our characters pretty well, exactly. though, too. And yeah. That's- yeah, if I'm if I'm sitting at another table with another game master, I I'm gonna read the table and all the players to determine how spontaneous can I really be, how crazy can I get with a character. I don't want to ruin anybody else's fun. Yeah. So for yeah. me, yeah. there are games that I'll play that are pretty crazy, and there are games that I don't. It really depends upon the situation, and in reading the table. You know, the first Akatakon I went to, I played in a D&D adventure, and I locked on to the fact that my character would, it said right in the description, willing to die for the party. So when we got to the final boss, we needed to distract him. I said, great, you guys sneak around. I'm going to distract him. And they all snuck around, and my character just walked forward. I am the champion so-and-so. You are to surrender. <laughs> I got mobbed. The game master looked at me and goes, you know you're going to die, right? I go, that's fine. That's what it says on my sheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I pointed right to it and, and Shane, the, D, the game master, went, fair enough. I wrote that down. You paid attention. You win. <laughs> yes, I, I won d and <laughs> <laughs> I maybe have had, at, at least at this point in the game, I maybe spend more time, particularly in combat, going, okay, how can I use these abilities? Because the the character... Sheet has been a real combination of sort of me and Chris because I don't have the character generator. So Chris has been the one to actually sort of make the character sheet and give it back to me. So mm-hmm. there are times when I'm trying to remember, but I haven't created the actual sheet. So, but at, through play, I'm remembering it more, which is true of a lot of my characters. You know, you after the boss fight, you look at your sheet when you're in downtime and going, oh, I forgot I had throwing axes. I yeah. wish <laughs> I wish I'd remember that. Well, next time those might come in handy, you're going to remember that. Yeah. So right. that's one of the reasons I like playing campaigns um, is you, you get that, you get the chance to, you know, it's not just a character sheet. It's sort of like a piece of music. Yeah, it's, it's, it's better to play the more familiar you are with it. Yes, exactly. It, thank you. <laughs> I got you. I'm just, I'm just going to say things and not have a plan on how to finish them. <laughs> the more familiar you are, the more you can improvise. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's it. And I think that goes back to the table discussion too. And like Chris said, like I am more likely to make bad decisions as Tazi playing, re- playing with the redemption group because I know that the people sitting across the table from me and across the microphone Hmm. will adapt and can adapt and we can we can make this it, it really just enhances the story yeah whereas playing at a table at a con i would likely not do those things because i don't know those people as well and i don't know how they'll react and i'm i again as chris said you don't want to be that guy at the table or that person at the table right mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you want to kind of make sure everybody's having fun yeah but it's easy with our crew to kind of throw that random thing out there like throw that grenade down the hallway and watch everybody scatter and see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I lucked into redemption during season three. So I literally went back and, and listened in a very different way uh, when they were like, Hey, you want to come in on guest star? And I was like, yeah. So I really got a, a sense and feel for the table before I came on, but it's still even different, you know, in actual play because of course they edit. So 
There are there are right. there are some different things. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's weird to sit down and like finally play with those people that you've been listening to for forever, and to be like, oh, you're you're not this like put together at all, super polished all the <laughs> yeah. time. You are. <laughs> I mean, I found that out with Shadow yeah. of the Wall, too. I mean, having interacted with them, at least, like, I knew that they were all a little bit nuts. But right. when you sit down to play with them, you're like, this is not anything like what I've been listening to. This is, this is trash. <laughs> 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 I'm so excited to be a part of it. Well, and what I appreciate about what we do often on the mics but doesn't make the podcast is we actually very much talk about sometimes from like the balcony level what's going on mm -hmm. and this is one of those groups where you can do that and still have like massive immersion and it just makes me so happy that i get to do both it <laughs> makes me so happy that sometimes i can i can ask you know oh a1 just pulled out a ticket a pair of tickets to the opera okay let's think about this what would that mean for tazi and isla to go on a date to the opera and then, of course, like, is it, are we somebody, are we going to do that? Yeah, we're going to do that. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think having out of character discussions is not a bad thing. Right. Like, it's it's okay to metagame a little bit if it gets you to a better story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the interesting things someone said to me after one of the more recent episodes, well, a lot of people have said some interesting things to me after recent episodes, but <laughs> uh, one of the things was, uh, I I'm shocked at how quickly you all thought of a plot for the opera. And I was like, yes, quickly. We didn't talk <laughs> about it at all. Uh, yes, there was not a half hour break in between those scenes no. at all. Yeah. Um, and we had editing. we had thrown around some ideas. No, no, there wasn't a half. That's the trick. Like but, literally, yeah. Chris as a one says, "Well, I got you guys tickets for the opera." And Emily and I literally look at each other, like I'm looking at the television monitor that her face is on, and she's looking at me at the table, and we're like, "All right, let's go." Yep. yep. Nice. Yep. We we might then be like, I mean, because we wanted it to also tie in, uh, you know, other mm -hmm. things like. You know, what's an interesting thing? And I forget who says who said what, but when someone was like, oh, what if it's a special thing for the emperor or not for emperor? He's not the emperor yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't know oh, that. Uh, for but the, for, for the, the senator. I don't remember if it was Chris or Emily or even Kendall that came up with the fact that it was a Gungan opera. Yeah, and that was not me. That, I did not think of the that. The moment that it was mentioned that it was a Gungan opera, suddenly we all like started throwing out descriptions of what would that look like? Like, what does that look like on stage? Wow. And then we came up with this, like, you know, this basically this hovering ball yep. of water surrounded by platforms so that human and Gungan actors can, like, endure scenes with each other in the water and then standing on platforms also. And, Ooh. like, it became this big creative synergy between everybody mm -hmm. as soon as that happened. And that was literally, like, four minutes of conversation. And then we dive into, like, a 20-minute yes. scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I like the... And and I'm in games that do this more and more. I really like that the players share some of the GM responsibility of voicing different characters. And sometimes that's, you know, planned and thought out. Like, you know, the things Yoda said at the knighting ceremony, like those were written out and Michael read them. It was really awesome. And mm -hmm. then there are times like, well, we've discussed what's going to happen at the opera and what kind of opera it is. And then Kendall breaks in in this you know, this boss Gungan voice and starts to introduce the opera and you're just like, yes! Yes! But part of that is a GM trick, so to speak. S to lessen if, your workload? But no. <laughs> yes and no. To keep, kind of, to keep people from being bored around the table. Exactly. Yeah. If somebody's not in the scene, they're going to pull out a phone or they're going to pull out a book and they're going to get distracted and that distracts me. Yeah. To see that out of the corner of my eye, I get distracted. Mm -hmm. So if I can keep them in the scene somehow, it keeps the distractions less for myself, which allows me to focus on the scene. And then I can also take notes, which can sometimes create more work for me later, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole opera scene, there was a uh, contact of Tazi's grandfather that showed up that Kendall just threw in. Yep. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that was going to happen. Nope. I just wrote notes here's his name here's what happened here's this and now we have a contact where we could actually maybe make some money mm -hmm. i'm yeah. glad you wrote that down chris uh it's in my notebook somewhere <laughs> oh, you just have it's to right listen to your podcast and i know right? you don't even have to write notes <laughs> well there's that too but 
I wrote notes down at the moment of this is what I'm feeling and thinking that's going to come up from this scene. You know, that that's kind of how I thought of it. Right. Uh, another good example with that kind of thought process is when Ken or when Carell uh, killed the Whippet that was trying to run away, I made a note right there on the spot. She will get arrested for murder and just mm-hmm. circled it and just <laughs> waited. And then I was just biding my time. <laughs> yeah, I just waited to figure out a way to get him back on planet. Mm-hmm. And then I could get my, you know, it was supposed to be a lesson that his character was learning to control herself. Right. And that was something that Kendall had actually told me he wanted was those kind of lessons. So I just worked it in that way. He wasn't expecting to be arrested. Right. I don't know what he was expecting. I don't. I loved I that. I'm not going to lie. Mm hmm. I was listening to that and I was like, yes, so good. Because that's something you, I place mostly one shots now. So that's something you don't really do in one shots. Mm -hmm. I was listening to um, an actual play earlier today too. And um, somebody rolled badly and the GM just said, oh, okay. Well, that'll come up later. (laughs) They were just like, don't say that. And it's like, oh, that's so good. (laughs) Just, Yep, that'll come up later. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, on Sass Geek, we usually say the opposite. Like, oh, that won't come up later. Meaning, of course, that it it will. Yeah, It for sure will. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. <laughs> so do you guys feel like the mechanics of building a character help reinforce the feel of playing the game? Or do you think that it feels like its own kind of separate step that doesn't really, aside from coming out with a character, um, doesn't really feel like part of the game? I'm a weirdo. I love sitting down and building characters. So oh, for so me, so do we. <laughs> yeah, just strange building. That. Yeah, uh, building a character for me just gets me more into the thought press of right. the game. And like a lot of the major NPCs, I build them as characters in the character generator, not just as an NPC, oh. because that allows me to kind of get in their headspace a little more. Okay, interesting. That's I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, all the reoccurring ones like Hicksa, uh, um, the director, those guys, they're all all typed up through the character generator. Very cool. Yeah, yeah I, I think that it enforces, I think that the character creation in Star Wars as the Empire really enforces the feel of play. You know, you're you're not going through, you know, putting in where you're going to get a negative one to this list of of skills you're you're really building your own skill set and really really saying like what makes sense for this character and in this crazy galaxy where people are are on the run like not everything has to be min max like i I think that it does help build the the feel of the game and Mm -hmm. quite honestly going through the going through building characters with more experienced people like I feel like I know the game a lot better now, like just through being on creation cast and walking through well, with you guys. we're glad we could help. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I think that it, it does a good job as you're going through of saying, who are you and how did you get here? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to an extent, you know, some of it is always going to feel sort of mechanical and crunchy because you do have yeah. a little bit of point by and you do have to kind of pick mm-hmm. those skills. And it, it's hard for character creation to be super immersive there are some that do it as part of a game you know i think of like headspace or something like that Mm -hmm. that does it as it is part of the game yeah one last job build that yep to build that that character but i think this does a pretty good job still of of getting you from Mm -hmm. a to b yeah while still being able to kind of tell your story along the way and if you if you're playing with a gm that does use the the obligations then when you are creating your character with your groups, it seems like you have a basic idea of kind of what the major overarching mm-hmm. uh, storylines are going to be based on everybody's obligations. You you know that one of them is going to come up at some point and relatively fast in the beginning, and you're going to have to resolve that. So you kind of have, right off the bat, before you even start playing, a feel for yeah. how your sessions are going to go over time. Yeah, I um I I find it a very interesting question about whether or not we should keep secrets from each other at the table as as in player to player. Yeah. Oh, I have so many feelings about this. Okay, so this is going to be a whole other part. Uh we're going to spend another 3 hours on this. But um <laughs> I I feel like in Edge of the Empire it would be very difficult 
to try and keep secrets because even even Isla with amnesia and building up some, you know, a little bit of backstory. If, basically, you were building up backstory for the crew to discover together with her. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's not like anything we thought about is, you know, a huge... See, okay, no, hold on. Uh, Sith sleeper agent. <sighs> I think game mechanics sure it is hard to surprise to players. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. You're it's hard for me to wrap something in your backstory that you don't know because I have to give you the skill in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that talent or that skill, yeah. you can't spontaneously learn it. Right. So it's harder to surprise a player with the mechanics. Yeah. Um, and I also feel like it's easier than to play off of each other because I've been the person with like the secret that I keep throwing out these hints, trying to get the other players to see and they never see them and I never get to tell them my secret and it sucked. I think the, from a from a player perspective at the table, as someone who doesn't GM, I think the moment you introduce a player secret, you're turning the table into a player versus player versus yeah. GM scenario, yeah. uh, and it stops being more. It stops being as much of a cooperative tale. If you involve the rest of the players, and if you can trust your players to keep that metadata out of the game, mm -hmm. right? Then you're building a better story overall. The moment that you try and sequester a player. You know, especially for any kind of long-term storytelling, you're really just building up. Mm -hmm. You're building up uh, problems at the yeah. table. Yeah, I think there's there's starts to be issues of trust between players, and I, I think if you're playing with a group that is, I don't want to say like grown up enough, but like to handle the difference between in character and yes. out of character mm -hmm. knowledge, that should be fine. And I, I I always have issues of you know agency and. I really think that there are so many things that should be kind of group decisions about like what is or isn't okay and like what you are or are not comfortable with at a table too. And I, I think when you start to have player to player secrets, you're sort of violating some of that trust mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, certainly some of those secrets can be pretty innocuous, but I just think that there's people should have the opportunity to say, no, I don't want that That's experience. Yeah. And I think that when you start to keep secrets from each other, mm -hmm. you are. Um, you're just creating problems. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And right. you, you and kind of need. A, sorry. Go ahead. You kind of need sign off from everybody if one of your secrets is, uh, you know, eventually I'm gonna be betraying you. Yeah. Be yeah, that's a really big, you know, it's a big yeah. ask to just, you know, like to drop on somebody yeah. in a situation, especially when you start to get attached to those characters yes. over a long campaign. And, and it might not be like a, I'm going to, it could be a, there's a high possibility that it'll happen. Right. Depending on how it leads up to that point. But as long as everybody's in on it and can play, you know, with that knowledge in the back of their mind, but still play right. as if their characters do not right. know that. Well, and one of the, you know, one of the really interesting things that's happened recently is this, uh, you know, test of the test of the wills, test of the spirit that Ke that uh, Carell went through. Uh, trial of the spirit. Trial of the spirit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Remember, um, I mean, some of the some of the worry, you know, throughout Isla's being on the show is, well, is she a dark side user is is she a sith was she trained how much does she remember and even though that necessarily that wasn't necessarily how you know i was going at it or playing it like you know just the the character of Corell is going to be suspicious about that mm -hmm. and so coming together with uh michael and chris and coming up with this idea for the trials of the spirit and me saying hey i'll go evil That'll that'll freak him out, <laughs> you know. That's a that's I and I could barely hold on to that secret. Mm -hmm. Like, like I mean, it was edited beautifully. Don't get me wrong. So you don't hear me in the background going, "Oh my god, is it time yet? Is it time Can yet?" I tell you you me <laughs> and then failing, and it being the perfect opportunity because my vibra sword gets cut in half, and I'm like, "Oh, oh yes, it's now." <laughs> But also knowing oh. that shortly, like within a half hour to an hour, like Kendall's going to know this is a force imagination dream thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like the <laughs> trial is a good example of how I use the system to my advantage. I purposely told Mike and Emily, I'm going to set difficulties 
that your character cannot overcome. I'm setting you up to fail. As a game master, I'm telling you up front, I'm going to use the system to create this scene. Please understand your characters are going to get beat up. You're going to get, you know, you're going to fail at at shooting things. Play that up, please. Mm -hmm. And this system's really good at allowing a game master to do that. It's easy to set uh, difficulties and set scenarios to either here's a layup for the player or here's the mountain that you're going to fall down. Right. And that's all starts with the way they build that character and the game master understanding how their character was built. You can mic drop right there. That's just perfect. That's it. That's it. We're done. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So how does the process of character creation set a player's expectations for playing the system? Sounds like we kind of went over some of that already uh, when we asked the mechanics question. Uh, just as a as a brief summary, uh, again, as somebody who plays and doesn't really GM the system, I'd say I feel like when I'm going through, when I went through and built characters in the system, it feels like Star Wars. The descriptions, like the way the talent trees are worded, uh, the descriptions of the the characters, the characteristics, and the specializations, it all gives you that feeling that you're building something in this universe that you can inhabit. Yeah, definitely. I I do like that there was a lot of flavor in the character creation process, pretty much throughout. I yeah, I think the talent trees do a really nice job of sort of capturing the archetypes that you see in in the movies and you know in the um the expanded universe stuff too because i think that star wars is really broad there's a lot of canon there yes to work through and it, i i i don't envy the job that the writers of this game had in front <laughs> of them and trying to boil that down into really you know i mean we only looked at one of the the source books but that is not a small task to kind of boil those things down into archetypes and and skill trees and i feel like they did a really nice job of of capturing those Mm -hmm. i agree and it what's nice is i feel that as somebody who comes without like all of that deep star wars extended universe knowledge that i get a really hefty flavor of what it looks like and even if i come into a game going i've only seen the main movies or maybe only seen like the, you know, the newest movies, like it it gives you a very firm idea and vision of the different types of people and what they're doing in the, in the universe. Right. Yeah. I I think that um, I'm somebody that has, I would say a medium level of star Wars knowledge. I've, I've read some of the, some of the novels and I've, you know, interacted with the, you know, I've watched the movies and I've I've listened to, you know, too many podcasts about Star Wars. But the sense that I get from the book is that you could walk into a game and have no knowledge of right. Star Wars and still be pretty okay because it does a good job of sort of giving you the flavor of the right. setting. Well, and I probably have the least amount of knowledge on the Redemption podcast about Star Wars. I just, I mean, there are times when the other guys are you talking and I'm like... I know, I'm a filthy casual. At, at the first time Darth Pelagus was mentioned, I was like, who in the world is that? And I had... You're like, Darth? Okay, he's yeah, that guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. I think that means Sith. <laughs> and it was funny because there were... I remember Chris doing these descriptions about like, oh, here's what... Here's some of the stuff Isla remembers. And, you know, Kendall and Michael are going, oh, I see where you're going with this. And I'm like, I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Which of so course works for my surprising character. For you. <laughs> yeah, luckily works for my character. <laughs> yeah, it does seem to operate as a pretty nice source book, even if you're not yes familiar with it. I have to say, um, which you should, because Star Wars is amazing. Or just so play a it. character with amnesia. There you go. I mean, really, some That's of my favorite moments have never been the like, wrong choice. and slavery is bad. <laughs> so we've we spent a lot of time saying these are things that we really love about this game are there things that you feel like this system could do better space combat (laughs) i agree yeah i've heard that um, that criticism from a lot of you mean like combat in ships in space yes starship combat yeah okay yeah 
uh, I, I, I let me give you my number one takeaway uh, from the first uh, couple seasons of our show yeah. and playing the game for as long as we have, and that is that being a pilot in this game, unless you are intimately familiar with the the space combat rule set and the best way to kind of describe those things, it's very clunky. Mm-hmm. You know, the trying to do the if you liken it to like say a movie where you've got you know Luke and Han in the guns and Chewie's at the cockpit flying the Falcon and you know there's some seamless cuts between the the Tie Fighters flying by and hitting the ship and Luke and Han taking their shots and like all those things cinematically described sound great but then to try to look at the way that they describe the rules on paper and create that same type of environment it's a lot more difficult in the way that they've set up the skill system for Starship Combat. That makes sense. Yeah, they tried to allow every character type to have a role during space combat, which is good because if you've got the face character and there's a space combat, he's not going to do anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, now he can co-pilot to help the pilot or he can go try to hack the computers. There's a lot of different options, but that is bad because then players look at the sheet and go, okay, what can I do? And they think about what, mechanically they can do versus just describing what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it, it adds too much in a way. It sounds like though, once you have done it many, many times with the same character, you m- may be able to get into a sort of groove. So then once space combat does come up again, you'll be able to more uh, organically describe what's happening. And and I think that that definitely is a good point. Again, the more frequently you do it, the more natural it becomes. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're talking about, you know, a long-term game with a crew of people who are taking on the same roles every time a combat yeah. comes up. Uh, I'm, but I think I'm when scared you look to at death the, of our first space combat. Yeah. With, with yeah Emily hasn't had the pleasure of doing space combat yet. Mm-hmm. And part of it is, is that much like, uh, like if, if you think about Star Trek in the same way, ships in Star Wars for the most part, tend to fly like ships in Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. Right? Like, the maneuvers they're pulling out in space, the things that they're doing, are things you would expect that a ship would do in a gravity-rich environment. Yeah. And also, I think, in most cases, space combat doesn't really give you a good way to describe 3D space. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, there is no, technically, there is no up or down. There's no north or south. It's all, like, kind of degrees. Mm Mm-hmm. And general directions and it's much more difficult to describe those things interestingly either to your table or in a podcast environment Mm -hmm. than it is if you're you know doing a a combat in a hangar bay Mm -hmm. you know with people on the ground shooting guns and fist fighting and those types of things the way that star wars does in space combat can be uh, intimidating right Mm -hmm. well i wasn't intimidated until now yeah that's a criticism that i've heard from a lot of people that have played the system is that it's just it it's kind of clunky and um i think probably takes away from some of that immersion to a degree because it's a little bit more mechanical and um you know you you are taking on some of those roles that aren't really necessarily characteristic for your character i'd be (laughs) willing to bet that our episodes of redemption where we've had space combat are some of the ones that kendall has had to edit the most I, I I'm not gonna lie to you that like those are some of my least favorite, but you I know, actually the, loved I actually loved the space combat stuff in Redemption. <laughs> just because Ryan never saying anything mean about anything. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I say highly edited because at the table, yeah. like we're literally trying to figure out what we're going to do to come together as a group to make this piece story mm-hmm. relevant or mm-hmm. to give it like that flavor that makes it interesting to listen to because. When we did our first space combat, like we sat around the table and kind of were going through the motions of it. We're like, wow, that – like we completely forgot what it was like to tell a story at that point and try and be flavorful and and try and really give the the scene a forward motion. Mm-hmm. And we became mechanical all of a sudden and just describing exactly what the ship was doing. Yeah. You know, I shoot at the TIE fighter. The TIE fighter blows up. You know, uh, I, 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 I say – I punch it. I make the ship go three times its speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we do t- we do evasive maneuvers, and suddenly you know we've gone from being a very expressive and telling a very expressive story to literally l- feeling like we're reading a list of directions. Well, 
in a in a somewhat let me just uh be a little bit of a devil's advocate here in a somewhat weird sort of sense your characters kind of would go into that sort of um strategic sort of mindset in those situations like okay i need to do this to punch it i need to do this to do these maneuvers i need to do this to get out of the way and position my gunner in such a way and and you're you're probably working more off of instinct at that point and not worried as much about how your character is feeling but i would argue that the that that as written and as described is not star wars right that's very true like that's where when you you when you lose that kind of feeling of that cinematic experience that the storytelling the mm-hmm. narrative dice can give you you lose that bit you lose that part of the game that kind of makes it feel like star wars like yeah i, wanna, I can see that i want to feel like i'm piloting an x-wing through an asteroid field with yep. tie fighters on my tail and the all the drama and the the intensity that comes with that i don't want somebody even I, even myself i don't want to play that and have it feel like i'm looking at a, a like mm-hmm. a checklist and i'm checking off boxes right exactly i want to feel that experience and and as a player like it's harder to do with the space combat mm-hmm. and i again I think you're right. I think the more you do it, the better you get at kind of working through the mechanical piece and finding the story. Mm-hmm. But I think the system as given in the book doesn't do a very good job of giving the player the tools needed to turn these mechanical moves into that fun story packed description to the table. Right. And I think sometimes that's not necessarily high praise to say just it just keep trying you'll get it eventually yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's not always the best like oh, well oh, and um <laughs> like it's a it's an acquired taste as the pilot on redemption <laughs> as the pilot on redemption and this is no jab at chris i i joke with him and the table frequently that i feel like i have a wasted talent tree because we rarely do anything that re- involves space combat so this is literally a part of a character that I've developed and spent XP on that we just don't really get much of use for because mm-hmm. we tend to avoid it. Mm-hmm. Well, and one of the, uh, I haven't been in space combat uh, on, on Redemption, but as someone who has had martial arts training and has then been in some live fights, I, you kind of don't think at all. It is it is exactly that. It is instinct. Mm-hmm. And it is in some ways that full immersion. So... I can see how that would totally that having to come out of that and and look more about the skills and I don't know what Isla would do. I literally I'm sitting here like should I pull up her character sheet and look? Like <laughs> I don't even know what her instincts would be. Right. And see like from a storytelling perspective that could be fun because you know we could throw you into a seat in the sh- in the ship and you could be yelling at us over comm like what do I do? What do I do? And then we can, you know, we play that as characters trying to explain to you what to do in the middle of a firefight. Yeah, that would be really compelling. Actually. You know, that's great. That's and so Chris file that away for future use. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but well, uh, I just at, think at about like time. my protocol oh. droid as like you know it, it, it's probably very similar to C three PO just running around going oh no oh no oh no like nothing <laughs> useful. I mean that would be like my instinct in that situation would be to be like. Like you recounting know. battle strategies from old Jedi battles that, you know. Yeah. Right. That, like, have nothing to do with this. But that's, like, that's, like, that's I don't think of this. I'm so sorry to bring in a different Star Wars actual play. But I think about the battle they did in campaign where Tamlin is trying to get ice cream. Like, there's, there's all of that other stuff going on, you know, guns and shields. And, and, and in the middle of this, there's a, a, five-year-old who has a turn and is spending all of his turns like trying to use his force powers to get ice cream (laughs) right hey man it's you know if it's in character and it is what your character would do in that moment it is not the wrong choice (laughs) truth that's awesome (laughs) yeah chris what do you what do you dislike about the system i think the force powers can get a little overpowered we've had to tweak some of those just a little bit like if you read move as it's written once you can hurl objects you can destroy things quick. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a discipline check against your silhouette. Your silhouette is a one. My difficulty is a one yeah. to throw at you. You're going to take 10 points of damage, and if I throw you far enough, it ignores soap. Oh. So two rounds, yeah. you're dead. Yeah, because yeah, falling but, damage. The yeah. worst kind of thing. Yeah. And Star Wars has no railings. Right. Yep. There well, is absolutely. no space and if you, if you If you get a Jedi mad enough... 
or you kill one of their best friends in front of them, they're going to push you off the edge. Yeah. Just But some of the some of the force talent trees add the force die in as a skill check. So you could take Tazi for example, his piloting skill can be the exact same as a Jedi that has the same piloting skill, but the Jedi gets to add that force die in there. That's mm-hmm. extra successes that Tazi can't get. Right. So that can really change how a character is built and how they balance with each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And that, that kind yeah. of leads into our next question about how balanced the different classes are. Because, yeah, it, it makes sense from a Star Wars perspective that the Force user that is also a pilot is going to be a, a way better pilot than the non-Force user pilot. Because that's how it is in Star Wars. Look yeah. at Anakin and his pod racing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, no human could do this. But, yeah, it's... Uh, he's he's disengaged his tracking device. Oh, I don't... Never mind. His targeting computer. He's, tar- he's targeting disengaged computer. his targeting computer. Thank you. So do you guys feel like stuff is pretty balanced? Or, I mean, aside from the Force stuff? I think it is. But part of that answer is going to be tied in with the fact that you have to understand your role. Yeah. A1 is not good in combat. No. But give him a computer or give him something to build, he's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Or a sabak table. Or a yep. sabak table. Yeah. So they balance the characters out really well, but you have to understand what your role is mm-hmm. and understand how that's going to play into the story. But it, it's nice because A1 still tries in combat. And, oh, yeah, he, and it's a, he has to. It, it's a good example of how the system handles unskilled people because he even succeeds at times and is a, a very yeah a very helpful uh, when he does succeed. But it, it doesn't hinder the party really uh, when he tries and fails, unless he fails with a despair and really bad things happen. Yeah. Use his weapon breaks or he shoots somebody else. Yeah. Or um, his leg breaks again. <laughs> <laughs> that poor droid. <laughs> Been through a lot. An old college injury. <laughs> <laughs> it's his trick knee. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree. I think I, I, I would agree with Chris that the, in fact, the Jedi powers even don't unbalance things for me so much as I will admit that bringing a lightsaber into play in a battle, like, so... In in Redemption, for example, the battle with the Night Sisters that took place on Rodia, like there was literally a, a point in that battle where the player Nathan and I both kind of looked at each other across the table, like, okay, well, we can just hang back. We don't have to do anything mm-hmm. because Kendall with Corel's lightsaber was just massacring these 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 NPCs, these enemies, and both of us at that particular moment kind of felt like, well, you know, we the specializations that he has as a combat person and the my pistol skills don't really matter right now. But again, part of that was the luck of the roles. So Kendall had some very good roles in that combat that allowed him to do some critical damages. Mm-hmm. Uh, but lightsabers in this system are very, very powerful, mm-hmm. which they should be. And they are rare. They're, they, they should be a rare thing. Yeah. But I would say, honestly, that's the only time in this system so far that I've ever kind of felt less than helpful or less than useful. And that's in any of their situations. Like you said, being able to do things untrained or with just the the base skill that you have uh, really kind of allows for some fun moments to occur. Mm-hmm. Again, failing forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then also some some lucky triumphs. Like you can I, you know, you can be totally unskilled at at setting the Nava computer and and suddenly you've kicked in the right coordinates and you've actually saved the ship a week of travel. Yeah, you know, um, little things like that allow that balance to happen. And the system, you know, you say you say classes are balanced. I don't really, I don't feel so much like it's a class based system, right? In the sense that there are there are careers that you pick from, right? But those careers don't limit you in what you can do. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you talk about classes, like obviously, like something like Dungeons and Dragons would come to mind, where you are a cleric class and these are the things that you do and you you have certainly a number of skills that might allow you to branch out in small ways but your focus is only these things Mm -hmm. and and if you want to do something different you have to take another class yeah Mm -hmm. 
And there's lots of other systems like that, but Dungeons and Dragons is the easy example. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in this case, you know, again, because of the way the tree system is is put together and the way you kind of like buy into other trees with that experience that you earn, it's easy to build your character over time using your in-game actions as a base for yep. what trees you expand into. That's what I've had the most fun with in this game is when it comes to the points where we're like, okay, well, let's actually spend some of our experience points. We've got some downtime. And then I start thinking about, okay, what did I, what have I done over the last like three or four sessions that I could use to increase some things on my sheet? Mm -hmm. Like Tazi, I ended up taking uh, some ranks in leadership for Tazi Mm -hmm. because we had a number of episodes where he actually kind of took charge of things and started kind of acting like a captain Mm -hmm. instead of someone who just owned a ship that a bunch of people happened to be on. Yeah. So that was fun to be able to use those things to build the character. And that balancing point between us is that you can really kind of put your points wherever you feel they work best. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a min-maxer, you can certainly do that. But I don't think the system really benefits you in that way. You know, to try and put all of your skills into like, you know, gunnery or ranged attacks Mm -hmm. or to put all your skills into like this one basket really at the end of the day makes you a hindrance because you – those situations where you're going to have to use that one particular skill or overpower in that one particular way are so few and far between versus, you know, the way Star Wars tends to run, which is, you know, things are going to change at a moment's notice and your characters have to be able to adapt to survive mm-hmm. or be very, very lucky. Right. Or have plot armor. <laughs> and I feel that that is in some ways more true to the life we live. I mean, the joke is always, okay, 5% other duties as assigned. Okay, but that's actually the main part of your job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, kind of in that same vein, do you feel like our group managed to to balance out as a whole? Do you feel like we've kind of filled all of those roles? Because I feel like, you know, sort of in that discussion about balance is the reality that you know, we're not all going to be good at the same things, but as a as a party, we can kind of even yeah. things out. I mean, if you break it down, we've got our our healer, even though he can only heal one Can't person. Heal any of us, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he can heal us with repair patches. I do have yeah. I do have the mechanic skill too uh, okay. that I took, right. so uh, I'm able to it, do some rudimentary he's repairs. Grown up with droids on an asteroid, he's gonna learn a little bit on how to fix them. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we've got our assassin droid, who's our fighter, so to speak. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got, you know, uh, me as kind of the leader. Mm-hmm. He's the face more. He's going to talk. Uh, the slicer would be kind of similar to like a wizard type role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll allow that. In some that. ways, he's going to get information. Now, I, then, I see the slicer is more like the rogue, honestly. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. I feel like that's a bit, uh, much Dewey, better. Uh, D three Wy is really more of our like wizard slash scholar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so our learned see, person. I see I see her more as or I see Dewey more as uh, a bard. Kinda has a lot of knowledge and is gonna keep telling us a lot of knowledge and learning things. So I, I guess to answer your question, we've hit a lot of different yeah. categories. Mm-hmm. Honestly, in combat, other than HK three one, we're gonna be pretty <laughs> rough. Yeah. It's gonna be rough. Yeah. When I was talking to send about potentially like doing this i i said i can't gm they can't be without the the fighter they just can't no. they you will can't, die yeah. i mean well, you we'll you could if you avoid if you avoided combat you know and if the gm was a little bit more lenient on you know the failed diplomacy sort of roles that you would do um yeah but you know Eventually, if uh, if we were to play these like in a campaign sort of deal, my character would become more and more adept at using the force. Right. And I'm already pretty far down in the move tree. Yeah. So I'm just a few quote unquote levels away from uh, getting to a point where I can crush people with boulders and, you know, statues. Statues. Yeah. Or deactivated droids. Or deactivated droids, yeah. Yeah. I would say the characters we have would be great for a mystery. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Or an investigation type thing, because we've got a lot of stuff that can do investigation and mysteries. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
That's for and sure. see, this is just me. I love the thought of our group getting into a fight and getting its butt handed to it. Oh, yeah. I love you know, the I, idea I like of us that. pulling Scooby Doo's. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, because we're getting chased constantly. Yes, exactly. So because we have to yeah. run constantly. Yeah. And Man, setting up traps of... for the bad guys and discovering it's not who we thought or it's exactly who we thought or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, it's always who Velma thinks. They are who we thought they were. <laughs> We would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you blasted droids and that kid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're the Scooby Doo, Ryan. (laughs) Roll, roll. You're our talking pet. (laughs) That's amazing. Found some Scooby snake. Some Edric snake. (laughs) Now, I guess the short short answer to your question is, yes, I think we've got a balanced party. And I think it's one that a game master has several hooks they can use. Yeah. And several different ways they can go with the story. As long not as bad, not bad for no session zero. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Well, how about let's get into our character advancement segment then and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So in this segment, we like to talk about how character advancement or leveling up works in this system. So how does a character level up in Edge of the Empire, and what kind of perks do you get? When, you, when that happens. You earn experience points, and I believe the rules say it's five experience points per, quote, game session. Mm-hmm. They don't really define a game session in the book. Uh, the best I figured is they look at that as about a two-hour game session. So pretty much every two hours, you're going to earn five experience points that you can plug into the character however you want. Okay. The only thing you can't advance are your characteristics. So you can put it into skills you can put it into your talent tree and just build the character how you want to very cool so it's it's effectively basically you're building up a pool to do what we just did through character generation yep well exactly that's easy enough that's easy enough i like that yeah and then there there's no real quote-unquote levels because you're just constantly putting points in and if you happen to go for 20 years with the same characters you're just going to have a whole lot of stuff bought in with that experience yep. that's crazy yep absolutely wow I like that though. yeah that is pretty cool so it's nice because it allows more flexibility yeah it's not okay i went from first level to second level uh now my armor class goes up by one my two hit goes up by one and my damage increases by three right you get to choose what happens to your character very cool and, well, and I think that that can be more narrative that way yeah. than too, that you can say this is, you know, applies to a thing I would have learned in the game. Yep. yep. And if there was a deficiency of some sort, say uh, only one of your party was a good combatant and you wanted to learn how to shoot a, a, a pistol a lot better, then you can learn that, you know, between yep. sessions. And maybe mm-hmm. do some in-character montages of that character teaching the other character or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Uh, so would it be beneficial then to have this sort of advancement mechanic in mind when you're creating a character? Yes. And I think the talent trees do that really easy for you because you get a snapshot of what your character can be if you just follow the talent tree. Right. So you can plot out exactly how many points you need and how many game sessions that's going to be before you can get the next uh, next tier mm-hmm. um, you can also look at your skills and know what you want to spend on skills it seems to Pretty... have all the prerequisites kind of laid out for you mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. in the, beautiful visual cost, form the, yeah the costs are all laid out there real easy for you hmm. yeah and I, I guess i didn't even think about that while i was creating my character is i looked at the the forest tree and i looked at the the cool ability at the end of one of the paths in the move forest tree and I said, I, I, I want that, but I can't get there right now. But uh, I can give myself a good boost in that direction. So if I were to play this for a while, then I would eventually get there. So totally. without even thinking about it, by creating my character, I thought about advancement for that character. Yep, because it's all right in front of you. Yep. Well, geez. The, that's a short discussion I know, that, on that advancement. That part was too easy. I know. I don't know. <laughs> it feels like it should be harder. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's just in this particular system, you know, there's uh, – the leveling process can be very simple. Yeah. I mean, that's – at the end of the day, you don't have to – you can spend as much time or as little time as you want 
kind of taking that XP and building your character up to the next yeah. a milestone for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Are you sure? Can I make it harder if I want to? Yes, of I, course. I, I'm sure you could. <laughs> I can always find a way. <laughs> yeah. um, I, f- I find it a lot... In- What's funny is in some ways it's a lot narrower than like leveling up in D&D and in some ways it's a lot broader because you're sort of, you're, you know, you're on the tree, you're following that path, but it's yeah. also something you've chosen and you have the ability to sort of do whatever fits narratively, which is something I really like because mm-hmm. um, I'm the... I'm the person who's been like, oh my god, I leveled up and none of my spells that I can learn are things I would actually use. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's such a terrible <laughs> feeling. I hate it so much. <laughs> I mean, that just tells you what kind of gamer I am, I guess. So mm-hmm. It doesn't fit with my character. I'm not going to use an <laughs> hey, ice spell, you know? okay? I need a fire spell. <laughs> Again, to go back to a-, a challenge in the leveling process or a negative, right? So I... Tazi, as a character on Redemption, has an entire talent tree that I tend to neglect because we don't use those skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when I do go to level, I actually have kind of less choices than I should because as we are playing and only leveling things that we're using, this is a whole talent tree that I'm neglecting. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And someday I might have to use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awan's got that too. Mm-hmm. I haven't leveled up any of his mechanic stuff in a long time. It's been slicing and gambling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) As you do. He knows what his priorities are. Mm -hmm. Which, (laughs) which when I first made A1 up, if you had told me, hey, a year from now, you're going to be taking a gambling as one of your careers, I would have been like, no, (laughs) this is a slicer mechanic. Let's stick with that. But that's how the story went. Yep. It just flowed that way, and that's what we're going with. Yeah, it's really easy to advance your character narratively in this game. Compared to some other game. Yep, absolutely. Wow, very cool. We did it, you guys. Yeah, we, we made it through. Yeah. Yay. Well, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Edge of the Empire character creation. It was an absolute pleasure to have you guys on the show. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was very this satisfied. This was a ton of fun. <laughs> Chris, could you remind everyone where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Uh, easiest way to get a hold of me is on Twitter. It's uh, Burlu underscore Chris. And currently, I'm working with the Redemption Podcast as the Game Master and also a player on a Shadow of the Demon Lord actual play called uh, Tales of Blood and Stone. Thank you, Chris. And what about you, Michael? I can also be found on Twitter at, at LoserMLW. And as far as things I'm involved with right now, uh, obviously, I'm playing Tazi on the Redemption Podcast. I'll be doing that for... In perpetuity, I believe. Uh, we've also got uh, Tales of Blood and Stone, which I record with Chris, which is, again, a Shadow of the Demon Lord actual play. And then we also, I also have um, the Return to Greyhawk show on Sunday nights on Twitch on the Greyhawk channel. And it is basically a, a 5e D&D return to the original Greyhawk campaign setting uh, with kind of an all-star star group of players and uh, one of the most knowledgeable Greyhawk DMs, I think I've ever played with. So uh, those are the three things I've got going on right now. Very nice. Thank you, Michael. Neat. Emily, how about yourself? Where can everybody find you online? I'm on Twitter at the crafty DM. You can find me on She's a Super Geek as the co-host and currently as the GM on the Wednesday evening podcast All Stars on the Misdirected Mark Network for Avanti Glitter and Blood. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here and sitting down with us. This was a ton of fun. It really was. We Absolutely. apologize for it's, everything. I'm, I apologize to future Ryan for all the yes. editing he's going to have to do. It's only six hours of raw audio. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my lord. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. And thank you for everybody listening for putting up with all of this, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us, guys. It was a lot of fun. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. 
Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. totally screwed up the buttons in my audacity because i accidentally clicked and dragged something and now my buttons are all screwed up and i don't remember control z (laughs) (laughs) i don't think that works for buttons damn it ryan why are you always so middle of the road gosh i just appreciate that like for as snarky as i am all the time ryan's always like this is great i'm so happy to be here (laughs) this is such a good balance (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, you, guys, it is. you can't make that decision when my mouth is full now you have to wait for me to finish this cookie oh. <laughs> i have a lot of snark to give and i can't do it with a mouthful of cookie not a lot of snarking to do that's my theme song should i do my vocal warm-ups first or all right yeah if you're willing to line them up regardless of when they start yeah i 100 well we've got old um, man river <laughs> That old man river. <laughs> awesome. Why are there are so many songs about rainbows? Can you sing that as Yoda, please. Oh, geez. I'm trying to do it backwards now. <laughs> Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions. But only illusions. And rainbows have nothing to hide. <laughs> oh. Okay. And so. scene. <laughs> uh, yes. Welcome to my nightmare, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder why you Usually have to like, Kendall's like, here to tone all the time. Yeah. Just, you're Wait, just did done. you say Kendall's usually here to corral us? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. That pun game is strong. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yay. And I still have a three word summary. <laughs> is it really cool character? <laughs> no, it's more specific than that. Oh, oh, okay. Well, then. Very cool character. Very and really are like the same, right? Hey, one's more specific than the other. Is it? Why, theoretically. To whom? Uh, yeah, scientists. I don't know. <laughs> you know, science. <laughs> it's like what I my kid went Star through the phase Wars. where he we just said, science. why? Oh, uh, <laughs> scientists. I love that as a general answer for anything. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Hey, you're welcome. When my kid went through the why phase where he just asked why, why, I finally was like, because science. <laughs> And so then that's now his answer for everything. Why? Because science. <laughs> it's, it's a good it's answer. It's not a bad answer. No. It's usually correct. So uh, what are we what are we doing here? What's uh, what's uh, what's the game plan here? Are we uh are we gonna start talking about Star Wars stuff? Um no, because now I have a kid. Hang on. What? I thought thought you had, I thought more you than had one. kids before. Like yeah. did you just like you just, <laughs> just, like, just now, showed up at the door? <laughs> Well, what? There, That's awkward. there are so many different kinds of of species out there. It is completely possible that she can procreate in such a short amount of time. Oh, I just, I just assume maybe somebody showed up, you know, at the at the gangplank for the ship, you know, dropped off a kid. <laughs> you know, hey, that, you know, 
Has that we met at, like, we met on Coruscant fifteen a, years ago, and now you that's have a kid. A really specific thing, Tazi. Has that happened? I don't. That's I don't. A, I can't that's how say. We got Zeke. Um, no, I, I don't. That's think. how we got Zeke. <laughs> I, I can't, uh, I can't, I won't, um, so yeah, Tazi, we're talking are about, you a, uh, characters. Are you an adoptive father and you haven't told me? I, I don't know, nope, oh, I, nope, don't know, if, no, I don't know, nope, nope. You don't nope. know or you nope. don't know? Those are two very different answers. <laughs> However you want to take this, whatever, whatever way yeah. makes this work for you is fine for me. <laughs> you, you said that in the snuggle pod too. Well, he hey, did, I'm, but I'm, we I'm had open. a safety word, so it was fine. I'm yeah. a very generous lover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's all we need to say about that. On that note, <laughs> okay, are we ready? Yep, I think so. For real, for real this time. For real. Wait, season. are we going for real? For real. For real. real. For real. For, for I am for real. real. Okay. What is this game about? Yeah, really. If you guys could tell us, <laughs> we would be grateful. So there's. Um, Earth, and then there's not Earth. Okay. And this game is okay. not Earth. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Okay. Yep. So yeah, the, the moon. Well, what did they say? It was it was spacefaring people doing space things in space, and sometimes not. <laughs> that's yeah, accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's also Star Trek. <laughs> so, Firefly. So is, it, is, it, is it nearby, or would you say it's far, far away? I would say far, far away. I would also say uh, not in the present. Yeah. And not the future, probably. You know, maybe more towards the past. Long maybe time, it was long it, time ago. Was it a long time ago? I think so. I think a <laughs> long a, time ago. Was it a really far long away. time ago? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, maybe, was it in the Milky Way or was it somewhere else? a different else? galaxy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I think the galaxy was, was far away. That it might have been right. far, far. Yeah. Yeah. Unclear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It so, sounds right. It sounds good. I think we. Fun. I think we got it. Nailed it. <laughs> All right. Podcast done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay, great, great. Glad you guys. You are shutting the creation cast down. That is it. We have answered everything for all time. Thank you. There's nowhere to go from here. Yeah, nothing. That's just an aside. <laughs> <laughs> Editor James. Editor James. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. If the death is not seen, it's possible there's a survivor. That's that's just fact. <laughs> Fair enough. I believe we call that a trope. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, uh, back on track. Yeah. Oh, they, they live. They go to bars a lot. They love. They learn. <laughs> <laughs> they spend a lot of time at the bar. They spend a lot of time at the bar. They spend a lot of time going. Do 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 do. I hate that song. Well, other this people. Is a- Friends. <laughs> I'm out of luck. <laughs> That's why I said other people, not friends. Pew. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotcha. So that's why he gambles a lot in this in the show. He's the most ambitious um character. Yeah. Well, he's also identified that we don't have a real source of income other than his gambling. I guess that's true. We could if we weren't constantly running around doing things for other people for free. That's true. Well, that's not A1's fault. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Someone's the captain. Captain makes the rules. Yeah, Someone has the, the title of here? captain, but doesn't really run the ship. <laughs> yeah, There's if only of, there was a powerful personality to be a first mate and actually step in and run things. Well, if Corel only. just got knighted, so she's going to do that automatically. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. All right. <laughs> Are they going to pay us, Chris? No, never mind. We'll 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 come back to that. <laughs> like, are they going to pay us to like? carry around a jedi uh you like now security squad for yeah, seriously i mean that it's not like the it worst should be a job yeah kind of dangerous though we're kind of like space bit. uber we're gonna get a flat rate <laughs> and then they're gonna take a cut <laughs> <laughs> well it's better than nothing would you call it spoober stellar uber stuber stuber <laughs> <laughs> oh okay yeah, I think if we kind of all go through our concepts and then we can kind of go through um, in a little more detail, maybe like in the order that they are mm-hmm. in the book, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Sure. Just because the goal is to to make sure that people listening understand how to do it. Mm-hmm. 
or to make Amelia understand how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to need to if you're going to be on uh, Sass Geek, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys think that we actually put this out a po- as a podcast, but we don't. It just, we have everybody come here to explain things to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. What the heck did I just listen to yesterday and today? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to fool you. <laughs> yeah, it's an April Fool's show. It's not a real a thing. It was all for you guys to get on our show. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> It was well. our day late April Fool's joke, a six hour day late April Fool's joke. Well, you got me. Well done. Uh-huh. <laughs> Three months worth of effort was all worth it. <laughs> <laughs> secrets, secrets are no fun. Secrets, secrets, secrets hurt, hurt someone. someone. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. I'm having a ton of fun. <laughs> <laughs> she gave me great advice and it rhymed. Um. Guys, I totally just lost all use of words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, two hour creation episodes. Uh, yeah, we we split five e- five episodes later. We're still here. We're still with here. The group from Redemption. <laughs> I just gave up on editing, and it's just raw audio from this point forward. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We've got four more episodes. If we had to suffer, so do you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. <laughs> but suffer in a loving way. That doesn't right. seem healthy. It's okay. the suffering you do because you care about somebody, exactly. right? Exactly. Now, children. <laughs> but mom, <laughs> don't make me use my mom voice. Okay, now I have I'll to use hear your mom your voice. Mom voice. <laughs> I got to oh, hear the mom you guys, voice. I got to use my mom voice on Jim McClure when we were at a catacon, and it was yes, the you best. did. It was the best. He is super into it. I'm sure. <laughs> it was well because we were playing terrible RPG, and I was being this mom slash Mary Kay sales lady. And one of my skills was you're grounded. <laughs> and it was <laughs> the best. So I just got to yell at, at Jim in my mom voice. Oh, that's... It was so much fun. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, for the but senators. The, no, the yeah, for, for, the, for the chancellor. Yeah. And she? the... Yeah, Chancellor Sheev. <laughs> and uh, and okay, also I that really it was a... I thought that that the, was not true. Somebody told me his name was Sheev, and I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> That can't be yeah, right. I think. I was trying to see who, where we are in our, our thing. Oh, here. yes. Okay. There we go. We have tangented quite a few times. Uh, quite a few, yes. We have. Well, and I was just like, is it my question? Uh, or? Yep. We're, we're almost out of tangent material, so I would imagine uh, we should be okay from here on out. <laughs> you underestimate. You think so? I got a lot of wood <laughs> to knock on over here, so. My daughter really wants a pet porg. She's like all about this. She's like, we should get a pet porg, but we don't even know what they eat. And I was like, honey, they're not real. They eat each other. Like, I don't want to crush Don't tell Emily dreams. that. Do not tell Emily that. Oh, we have we have like five stuffed porgs yeah. around the house. So I wanted a porg forever and I just, I couldn't afford one. And so the crew of Redemption bought me one. Oh. That's awesome. So it wasn't a like death threat porg? I, no, that was just the joke I made. <laughs> because it happened to come like right after the episode a cliffhanger of where everybody thought Isla killed Tazi. Yeah. And I was like, it's the horse head. It's the horse head. It's the Star Wars <laughs> ver- version of the horse head in the blankets. <laughs> I love that. Future Ryan, thank you for uh, putting up with past Ryan and his uh, shenanigan buddies online here. Oh, I like that shenanigan buddies. That could That's actually a great name for an actual play. Oh, there you go. <laughs> shenanigan buddies in the snuggle pot yeah <laughs> i think you just wrote like a, a romance hollow vid for uh the redemption podcast i think we'll have to keep that yes yeah, someone write that down i hope that comes up later shenanigan buddies and four robots and a human <sighs> awesome definitely a sitcom exactly because we just have to make it through the closer <laughs> okay okay <laughs> okay um Thank you for joining us on the Creation Cast. <laughs> yeah. Michael, where can people find you online? <laughs> Emily, you let him do his job. Exactly. Focus. You have your own podcast, okay? <laughs> well, so do you. Yep. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm trying to have a podcast. Do, 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 do. Cut before this point. Yeah, we hope to play with these characters again and sit down with you guys again at some point. So oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Oh, we did it! We, did we it. made it. We made, we made three or ten episodes of Creation Cat. Somewhere between three <laughs> and ten. <laughs> it's that specific. Somewhere in there, yes. there's a there's there's a couple episodes that we could use. So 
there's probably like 15 minutes of usable audio in there somewhere. <laughs> cool. Well, we can uh, go ahead and stop our recordings. No. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows, like Neoscum. Neoscum is a future fantasy comedy podcast featuring five Chicago improvisers antagonizing their way through the role-playing classic Shadowrun. It follows a group of misfits and outsiders as they dole out street justice to every deep they encounter, whether they deserve it or not. Starring Blair Britt, Eleni Sovajo, Casey Tony, Mike Migdal, and Gannon Reedy as the Game Master.